The female body on a worldwide consideration retains the characteristics of youth much longer than does the male body. Can you get in the picture? Less or fewer women have hardening of the arteries than men, the incidence of ulcers than men, and again, most of the deterioration and the signs of age show less in the female body than they do in the male body. Told you I was going to prove a point. There's more heart failure and apoplexy in men than there is in women. Women can usually hold their breath without deterioration of cell structure, deprived of oxygen, and much more easily, I'm sorry, less suffocated than men. And women can usually endure cold weather on a general basis better than men and can adjust to heat temperatures when their thermostat works correctly more so than men. Are you beginning to see the picture of the proof of what my opening statement was? How many of you are still with me? Confusion and puzzlement. Oh, good. Women in general at higher altitudes, like in the Andes Mountains and so, can usually carry your heavier loads than men because the muscle fiber is toned better and the amount of oxygen within the cell structures is greater than that of men. The female brain not only has a finer texture and more complex organization than that of the male, but relative to overall body weight, it is one quarter pound heavier. There are fewer female baby miscarriages than there are ba male baby miscarriages. And during childhood, the female is mentally superior to male because the girl of seven, usually because of the rich thyroid hormones, has a brain capacity and a body capacity that dwarfs a boy in both mind and body. They're usually taller, more symmetric, and have better brain cohesion and function than does the boy. So now you understand that I have hopefully proven to you my opening statement. Is there anybody now that disagrees with anything that I said? I didn't think you women would. <laughs> and I know the fellows have just said, what in the world has gone on with that nut up there? Bear with me, okay? Menstruating women in general lose calcium, thyroxin, iodine, phosphorus, lecithin, vitamin E, vitamin B1, 6, 12, 2, 6, magnesium, manganese, iron, copper, zinc, and sometimes, for some women, this starts two weeks prior to the menses. You think about that. Calcium, for instance, stabilizes the nervous system. Phosphorus is found in all healthy, normal cells. Iodine causes the growth and maintenance of the thyroid gland and this is why the thyroid gland in women tends to swell during menstruation. I give you another key so you don't run off and spend all your money at the doctor's. I repeat that. That's why the thyroid gland in women tends to swell during menstruation. Science has proven that the birth of congenital idiots increases when one travels inland where the soil and the food lacks iodine. Iodine is also an essential element for the maturation and maintenance of healthy female cells. What is very interesting is that not all women on this planet menstruate. Also, not all women on this planet have ever menstruated. But all women think that all women do. Let me also spend a little time with that concept. Most Hindu women do not and definitely did not menstruate. One of the last famous Hindu women to achieve prominence on a world statue was Indira Gandhi. 
who until she started doing certain things and making certain practices as she toured the world, readily admitted she had not suffered a menstrual period until she began to do these things. Had she but followed her religious undertakings, maybe it never would have started. Most ancient African or Kemetic women did not menstruate. Not Belchus, not Apatia, not any of the so-called queens of Africa seemingly did once they began to have knowledge of self. The Oracle of the Delphi, according to the Greeks, were a group of women who pontificated and led Greece through its heyday. It was not led by the warrior men. They did the fighting. The thinking was done by the oracles, and many of the oracles were females. They are said that the oracles did not menstruate. We hear a lot of talk about the Amazon women, the Teutonic women, the female Gauls, the West African Watetetas, the, West, the East African Bossamans, the Andambis of the Congo. Most of these Oceanic women and most of these Kemetic women did not menstruate. These women were the strong women of our history. And in many cases, they could grow to be seven and eight feet tall. That's why amongst the Watusi and the Watusi women, when they told you of their diets and things that used to be different, they have some of the most tall or the tallest women and persons, in fact, on earth itself. The Old Testament said, and the ancient Hebrews said, that menstruation was unclean and that a woman should be confined until cleansed of her issue. But understand again, a lot of that book was tampered with by a patriarchal society, and if you're not aware of that, and I think most of you should be, then we have a lot of interaction that we could go through. With the advent of mahogany, mahogany, and now I'm thinking about Africa, monogamy, by what we would call the Christian forefathers who wanted their church to uh, really flourish, came the taught, learned sensation that menstruation was correct, menstruation was necessary, and was the woman's paying for her sins for having made Adam eat the apple and now must also bear her child in pain and affliction. And many of you bought that, didn't you? I state to you that menstruation is not a cleansing process. It is only the result of the deterioration of the egg, unfertilized, and that men have perpetuated a myth that women collectively have bought. And I can at least begin to forgive some African comedic women because they didn't have too much of a choice. In their old habitats, in their old lands, many of them, as I say, were taught better. I'm going to now talk to you as adults, if I already haven't, and I hope again you will accept these things with an adult mind, and then on the Q&A, jump me. I'm sorry, talk to me. Question me, if you will. The whites is a street slang for a term called leucorrhea. It is an issue, a secretion from the vaginal area, which women sometimes suffer from. If the womb becomes catarrhal, has mucus, has a cold, the whites is one of the results. The inflammation of the uterine lining produces, in many cases, menstruation, and many things can cause that, as we shall talk about. The fluids lost in leucorrhea, or colloquial on the street, the whites, are important vital substances. Lipoids, alkaline lactates, natural sodium, potassium, calcium, plus brain and nerve foods in the form of lecithin. In fact, the mucous corpuscles present in leucorrhea are presently hemoglobin capable. What do I mean by that? 
it means that they are capable of forming human blood carrying oxygenating corpuscles so not only does a woman then suffer the menses but if she also has no chorea she is constantly losing the ability to build life giving blood cells which anyone knows without that the body does what deteriorates some women are on a constant menses and then you wonder why some women are very irritable very agitated anemic they get dizzy and have migraine headaches and jump at the sound of a firecracker 20 miles away which they think they can hear if anyone suffered that kind of loss from puberty till death i wonder again why women are not half crazy there are some men and other women that say they are i didn't say it i say faced with that loss we could have a problem i state that if the menses was cessated if it stopped if the blood loss and even the alkaline lip plate loss was ceased and stopped then not only would women be very strong and they wouldn't be intuitive they would be psychic but they also could give birth to babies without a man being anywhere around and there is the key to your problem and your problematic solution you've bought into the coat's lie the white coat's lie the medical doctor's lie which came about under a patriarchal system if you start understanding the cadavers that were messed with in England and France at the turn of the 17th 18th century and experimentation still goes on in fact they by law are given under the caduceus the right to practice and the practice is upon in many cases you as females there was a theory called the august theory spelled o v i s t produced i'm sorry pronounced a ah. it was proven not postulated i repeat proven by dr professor jock loeb of stanford university that the embryo develops from the egg alone and does not require spermatozoon did you hear what i just stated according to professor loeb you can make a developing embryo to become mitigated and go into first second and third trimesters of birth without the need of the male sperm under certain circumstances the prevailing medical theory is one of epigenesis and it says again that you must have the union of sperm and egg in order to produce and in order to get pregnant maybe to start this and give it practicality we have to go back to a basic concept that some people still are not sure about i state that women had to have been created before men or formed before man because you cannot get a man from a man you cannot get a woman from a man but you can get a man from a woman and you can get a woman from a woman and think about that any problem with that statement that compound complex sentence i don't have one this is what the old church the church of england and under king constantine and the bishop eusebius the church of rome had to get rid of and had to change the last honesty amongst caucasian principalities dealing with christianity and especially catholicism came with the onset of the greeks who broke away into the greek orthodox church because they got tired of the lies that were being formed and wanted to continue with some semblance of truth from the greek society the last time when the caucasians told truth
The male cannot reproduce himself. The female can. What does that mean if carried to the furthest extent? It means that if the woman also could decide whether she was going to produce a male or a female, the race of man could cease to exist, as we now understand it as a double gender. That, at one time on earth, was a tremendous problem. The universal cosmic egg theorem is that a cosmic egg was created and from that generated everything and that in the egg still is the semblance of first creation. Things start from an egg, whether it be a hard shell finish or a little ovum attached to the uterine wall. Which came first? The chicken or the egg? In 1975, they connected a vibrational detecting device to an unfertilized egg. And they got a rhythmic pulsing beat just like that of a human heart or pulse. What is generally an unfertilized egg? Why kind of share with me quickly from the audience? What's the difference between an unfertilized egg and a fertilized egg? Chicken didn't mate, no males around. Yet they have detected, and that experiment has been tried and tried again, some kind of rhythm or pulse within that egg itself. They also found in vertebrates, those that have a central vertebral column again, a spine, if you would, that on the phrases and oscillations of the moon, that pulse varied, but was always even more intense. We understand that humans are the dominant species on this planet Earth. We are the masters, we are the greatest, and everything else is beneath us, right? Hey. Right, yeah, right. The acorn, which has a seed, a phylum of vegetable and plant, contains everything in it that the seed needs to become a mighty oak, including a print on its plum showing what it's going to look out when it matures, what it's going to look like. Isn't that interesting? Ever cut an acorn in part and looked at it? I mean, some of these mutated acorns now that have been gassed and pre-picked, you can't tell anything from. But get the real seed of a pure bone acorn, and what do you have when you cut it in half? Picture of a tree. I mean, that's somebody really uh, blueprinted that one. They already said, this is what you're going to look like when you grow up. And that's just on a little acorn. Okay? Let's go to another phylum, an animated phylum. The silk moth. The silk moth reproduces and never mates. Reproduces without a mate. The lowly aphid reproduces without a mate. And as the ancient Egyptians tried to point out, the scarabus, scarabus beetle, reproduces without a mate and can shed its skin and goes along every seven years quite well, it dies when it does mate. And if you remember, on the Ankh and the Scarabus, you found in your Valley of the Kings, and you found again amongst the pyramid and on the Sphinx itself, that sacred symbol of the Scarabus. They were trying to convey something. Most of us have forgotten or never knew what they were trying to convey. Dr. Edward Bischoff, MD, started this modern theory of epigenesis in, I'm sorry, 1854. I want you to jot on that date because people think this has been going along for a long time. It has not. That's close to the turn of the century. Dr. Edward Bischoff started the theory and the story of epigenesis in 1854. That is, that the zygote 
and the uterine development by union of sperm and egg was the way that humans get started. The first trimester after fetal conception.